I think um, with your schedule being so busy, we shouldn't delay and just get started. Um, so for everyone on the line, my name is Luke Whitington. I'm the Executive Officer of the Search Foundation. I'm your host of this evening's event. Um, before we begin, please be aware this briefing is being recorded so we can post it later to the YouTube uh, be on the line. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging, as we always do, that we're meeting here in Australia on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land and sovereignty of this land was never ceded. I pay my respects to the Elders past, present and emerging of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, traditional owners of First Nations all across the continent. I'm on Gundungurra and Darug land where we say, Warami Gundungurra, welcome comrades. We're incredibly lucky to have Sharon Burrow with us on this Zoom call to talk about the corona crisis and what people globally and the response and priorities of the international uh, I'll do a quick intro to search and then I'll introduce Sharon. That should only take about 30 seconds and a minute respectively. So search is a democratic membership based organisation that links and enables socialist activists, political parties, generations and movements all across Australia. We have members from diverse backgrounds and interests, but we have common aims and values summarised in the terms democratic ecological socialism. We run education programs, publish news and views at search.org.au and on Facebook, and we put on events like this one tonight. As I've mentioned in the chat, um, Sharon will speak for around 25 to 30 minutes and then we'll have questions, which I invite you to submit in writing in the chat section. Um, but that will be directed straight to me as the host. So if you'd like to discuss what is being said, you can comment in the Facebook event page discussion. And I've posted the link to that in the chat. Um, for many of you, our guest needs no introduction, but I think we should take one minute to place on the record her impressive list of achievements and some of her background. Sharon Barrett was elected General Secretary of the ITUC at its Second World Congress in Vancouver in June 2010. Prior to this, she held the position of ITUC President since its founding Congress in Vienna in November 2006 and the position of ICFTU President since its 18th World Congress in Miyazaki in November 2004. She's the first woman to have held any of these positions. Sharon was born in Warren, a small town in Western New South Wales, into a family with a long history of involvement in unions and the struggle to improve the lives of working people. Sharon studied teaching at the University of New South Wales and began her teaching career in high schools around country New South Wales in the late 70s. She became an organiser for the New South Wales Teachers Federation based in Bathurst and was president of the Bathurst Trade and, Trades and Labor Council during the 1980s. Sharon was elected vice, Senior Vice President of the New South Wales Teachers Federation and became President of the Australian Education Union in 1992. She represented the AEU on the ACTU Executive throughout the 1990s. Sharon was previously Vice President of Education International from 1995 to 2000, at Education International being the International Organisation of Education Unions representing 24 million members worldwide. In May 2000, Sharon became the second woman to be elected President of the ACTU and in October 2000 became the first woman to be elected president of the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, Asia Pacific Region Organisation. She served as a member of the governing body of the ILO, the International Labour Organisation, and a member of the Stakeholder Council of the Global Reporting Initiative. As part of her ILO responsibilities, Sharon chaired the workers group of the subcommittee on multinational enterprises. Sharon was re-elected General Secretary of the ITUC at its third Congress in Berlin, May 2014, and its fourth Congress in Copenhagen in December. We're delighted to have you online, Sharon. Uh, tonight, please tell us what does the COVID-19 crisis working people globally and what are the priorities of the international trade union movement at this extraordinary time? Well, thank you, Luke. And um, I must say, it's a rare privilege to talk to Australian uh, comrades in their homes, I might add, I'm sure for most of you. And uh, at this tragic time, I threatened Luke if he read out a bio that I would uh, not speak to you, but I won't punish the rest of you. I'll hold it. I'll hold him personally responsible. It'll cost a few beers when we uh, see each other. So thank you for inviting me and I'm happy to be with you. I am sharing my second cup of coffee of the day with you because I can't function otherwise, as those who know me well understand. So first of all, you know, it's a tragedy. I mean, it's just all you can say about it. It's a health tragedy, of course, and that's first and foremost our concern for people everywhere, but it's also a working uh, uh, and a social and economic tragedy with working people 
being at the helm. We, uh, we recognise and thank our frontline workers, of course they're health workers, 70% of them are women for the record, and, uh, but also all those unsung heroes as well in our supermarkets, in our pharmacies, the transport workers, the government service workers, the care workers who don't get a lot of recognition in this, but in, in aged care homes, still providing childcare, the services teachers are providing online now in most countries. This is a remarkable effort. While the rest of us may be busy in our homes, but we're comfortable and relatively safe. So I want to put on record our thanks everywhere to the millions and millions of workers who are keeping us safe and indeed uh, fed and healthy. When you look at where we started on this, it was just a month ago really that the world realised that in fact this was going to be a global phenomenon. It wasn't just something China had to get under control, it was everywhere. So of course having gone through the 2008-2009 crisis, which in terms of the impact on the workforce, I have to say pales into insignificance now by comparison. It was a financial crisis started by the speculative nature of the finance sector and it impacted on the real economy. We saw unemployment shocks, we saw the economy take a hit, but this time it started with people and therefore it started in the real economy and while there are some aspects of financial crisis, credit squeeze and other areas. Nevertheless, this is a crisis about people, not just an impact on people. So our first set of uh, a line of defence, if you like, was to call for all nations to back in our affiliates, to have five essential criteria met. Of course, uh, um, health had to be at the forefront and I have to tell you only 50% or just over of countries provide free public health cover. That tells you everything really in terms of the risks, let alone if you examine the capacity of, uh, of the uh, hospitals and clinics and doctors and nurses in developing countries to provide. And we'll come back to that a little um, in the course of this. But of course we wanted paid sick leave and wage support where people were not able to go to work. We also put another category in income support, which tells you something about the nature of the workforce. <clears throat> because of course this is for people who were, were not employed, but equally for many, many millions of people who are employed, whether it's on platform businesses, whether it's freelancers, independent contractors, whatever the denomination, and of course the informal economy. If you think about the economy, the global workforce that held up the economy before the crisis, then 60% of workers were indeed working informally. And that included those, uh, <coughs> those emerging platform businesses because they've never been regulated. This is a failure of governance. It was a failure of governments to regulate the labour market. Now, I'm not pretending that all, all the future of the labour market ought to be is direct employment. That's unrealistic as well. But there is a way we can have employment rights across all forms of work. And we can have work declared for what it is. Where it is direct employment, it's got to be declared as such. And we can come back to that, I'm sure, in the months to come, because it's got to be part of the recovery and reconstruction and resilience phase. So, of course, income support has been vital. And, uh, and then in addition to that, we wanted to see that uh, indeed uh, workers were secure at the very basic level. So while we call for a global social protection fund urgently, because there are millions of people without income, just I can't even tell you in words the tragedy of the... Uh, letters I get from developing countries, people who lost their job, who have no income at all, can't migrate for work, and haven't yet been supported by authorities with even basic food, let alone sustenance. So with the ILO and, the <clears throat> and uh, other agencies, the World Food, Food Programme, UNICEF, we are desperately trying to get up, in addition to the UN Humanitarian Fund, once and for all a global social protection fund because just over 10 years ago now 
the world started talking about universal social protection. And of course, it includes all those elements that uh, we all understand. It is about um, health. It is about basic uh, <coughs> provision of uh, education and care. It is about income support, unemployment, uh, unemployment benefits, pensions, child protection, maternity protection. Well, only 29% of the world's people have some form of what we call satisfactory universal social protection. So this is the time to build it. Otherwise, these countries won't come back at, at anywhere near the strength of today, but they will uh, indeed be left behind once again. Just to give you a sense of even where the government packages have been quite good. Nevertheless, if you go to, um, to the Asia Pacific, then 64% say that it's not enough to live on. Indeed, in the Americas, it's 45%. And I might tell you that evil Bolsonaro is the only leader in the world. Trump started it, but Bolsonaro still denies uh, that the uh, virus is anything but uh, fake news. So people are struggling everywhere. We know in our economies, I'm very, very, um, uh, you know, proud of the ACTU. It's done a magnificent job against a conservative government. And of course, to many of our state governments. But when you're dealing with countries around the world who are not used to actually having to think about people who are in fact on that uh, trajectory of um, or, or, uh, autocratic, dictatorship, fascist, whatever it might be, and that's increasing everywhere as you know, then this is a very new world for them but it's a disastrous world for their people. So then we move from the support of our national affiliates and calling it out where it wasn't actually being delivered. And we looked at the global environment with, with uh, some of the employers. I wanna come back to the employer community, but with some of the employers and uh, the ICC led by John Denton, actually another Australian. And I called for coordinated action We've been working as social partners with the IMF, and I am really pleased to be able to support another woman. The managing director of the ILF, uh, IMF, Kristalina, is actually a very human um, individual. She understands that while the economic settings are really important, people have to be at the centre of those. So her call has been very structured. Yes, we need uh, special drawing rights, but they need to be designed to enable liquidity swaps so that if our model was the one that was chosen, we're not so orthodox about the model, but that money would go from the wealthier countries into a global trust fund that would enable support for developing economies. She also uh, has worked on their own um, immediate relief fund and got it up to work uh, hopefully a trillion dollars and she hopes to double that because 96 countries unprecedented 96 countries have asked the imf for help or urgent advice and that's the highest number in history and then of course uh, she's worked to uh, contain <coughs> a, a, the world bank i don't have any respect for malpass really who now heads up the world bank he's an american and he's calling for structural reform associated with debt relief. We have to beat that. So many of us have gone out and argued with a lot of allies that debt relief is essential, that it, it can't come with the old conditionality, that you have to give these countries a chance to uh, recover. And so it should be aligned with conditionality on the leaders of those nations to invest in their people in SDG, uh, Sustainable Development Goals aligned investment and in this case health social protection goal one goal three and of course goal eight which is uh, decent work and full employment so those uh, those international organizations were slow to react but with kristalina's leadership amongst others then we now have got the spring meetings this week and ahead of the spring meetings as late as the end of last uh, week we prioritized the debt relief question both again, the ICC, us, and a wonderful global civil society organisation, Global Citizens, actually have called for the leaders at the spring meeting to put that at the heart. There's also the coordination of central banks. 
And uh, while there's only 24 in the IMF uh, structure, they're the 24 with uh, wealth. And so we've called for their coordination. That'll be even more important as we come out of the, uh, of the crisis and into the recovery and reconstruction phase, because frankly, if they do what they did in 2009-10, then we will see ourselves in, a, again, a long period of uh, uh, an environment where there's little fiscal space unless governments change their views on debt and monetary policy becomes pretty much useless. So for the economists amongst you, I'm sure you could talk about that all day. Let me just go then to the, um, to the question of employers, because the huge impact beyond uh, the developing country picture that I've given you a taste of is the supply chain environment. There's almost been a total absence, ironically, of multilateralism. You know it was already in crisis. Well, we had to fight to get a uh, G20 uh, leaders summit. It was an unprecedented uh, um, statement of unity, ironically, and I can't tell you what the fights have been, particularly with the US, but others in the last couple of years in any multilateral environment. But in, the, in this context, it was unprecedented. But it, while it committed a lot of money, five trillion, some later talked about seven or eight, nevertheless, it wasn't, was short on detail. So we've had to fight since to get a Labor Minister's meeting at the G20. It'll finally happen on April 23rd. And we, of course, want the OECD to bring together finance ministers, but we also need now a partnership with health and, uh, sorry, Labor Minister, we now need a partnership with health and finance ministers. So we're all working on that. But the issue that is troubling us in terms of recovery, well, first human impact now, but then recovery, is the supply chains. In the essential supply chains, the first set of obstacles for us all to deal with was that no one was paying attention. It was, it was fine to close borders to protect people, People are very tolerant of this, but there was no planning to keep open the essential supply chain routes for pharmaceutical products, health, other things. The world is now paying attention to that, and we have uh, agreements around green lanes and so on to allow essential products through. There are still blockages, but they're now easier to protect and to deal with. There's also a lot of market gangsterism going on, and don't know if you realise it, but on on the runways of China and uh, on the borders even of Europe, the uh, fight to uh, basically treble or, or more the price for essential uh, PPE equipment has seen governments behave in appalling ways. I mean, just appalling ways. Paying two and three times the Chinese suppliers, blocking trucks that Sweden had ordered on the French border. You know, I mean, I can't pretend to tell you how the retreat into self-interest has affected what we would normally see. We'd be critical, but we'd normally see as a more coordinated world. But that's largely in hand, if, uh, if not yet uh, the supply of essential products we need, although many, many factories are retooling, tooling up, changing their uh, focus. I, I heard that the gin distilleries in Australia were making uh, alcohol or hand sanitizers. so there you go. I hope you're not drinking that though. And, uh, and then the non-essential supply chains is the area of real disaster. To give you a sense of that, you know, of course, you all know that uh, tourism, hospitality, etc., has just collapsed. I'm not sure how and when that will come back. I don't want to be a doomsayer, but in fact, if you think about people's trust, some adventurous souls may take opportunities of cheap deals and so on but many people particularly with families or older uh, people will not travel until they believe the world is safe again and who knows how long that will be um, there are there is talk in some countries of still not well opening up gradually not allowing people uh, across borders so depends how long that lasts we could see an interruption to that sector that is just disastrous for years to come. But then other areas, if you take textiles, for example, the, uh, the textile and garment in the garment industry is actually built on cheap labour. So for years, we've fought these dehumanising 
um, exploitative supply chains. But I tell you right now, I'm trying to fight to get the resources in there to keep them alive because you're talking in Bangladesh alone, more than 2 million people in the textile factories. And if those factories go down, they were already under at risk. Factories were closing because of the global slump and because of the technological shifts. So as people onshore with 3D printing, the supply chain changes and countries like Cambodia, Bangladesh, Myanmar, right throughout the uh, developing uh, world in, in our part of the world, i.e. Asia, then uh, it's not too different in Africa, although the trajectory is a bit slower there to take off. Then you have um, got millions and millions and millions of workers who are not just at risk now, but if you listen to the Justin Trudeaus of the world and others who are, um, while they're you know, good leaders in many ways in today's environment, one of his first thing was they're taking their supply chains back to Canada. Now that won't be everything, obviously, but even if you think about the tendency for countries, they will never be, and I've had to lecture trade officiandos who think it'll all come back to normal, but I can't see people or leaders in many countries ever being caught without a capacity, and they shouldn't be, to manufacture essential products in a, in a crisis like this. And so that's gonna change the nature of trade anyway. And then the 3D printing environment will of course change the supply chains because you need a very different set of supply chains for the products you put in a 3D printing um, environment than you do actually in terms of ready-made uh, um, products. So I'll, I'll probably finish on just a couple of other things, but I wanted to say that that's our big fear now. And right now we have a mixed environment in the employment, in the employer community. On the one hand, I can say that globally, we probably never had a more constructive set of discussions. It kind of reverts occasionally when you're trying to get agreements as we are now around uh, the garment sector with the big brands. But people know that the old enmities have to be put aside because you know you can see the fault lines in what was wrong with the global economy that they denied in terms of the regulation of the workforce you can see the fault lines in financing and you can see the fault lines now in the security of supply for the major companies but we are empathetic because of course with all the retail companies except amazon close Amazon's, if ever we were worried about it being a global monopoly, now it's showing its true colours because while all the major retail shops for anything other than essential products are pretty much closed down, it's running away as normal, not with very safe environments for its workforce. But the, so all those things will have a reckoning, but those big uh, uh, retail brands have no cash flow. And believe it or not, major companies like I want wouldn't want this quoted, but major companies like Disney and others are actually struggling for cash flow. There are, of course, it's leading again to speculation. In the, in the biggest irony, I was talking to um, desperate workers actually, so I shouldn't be smiling, who've been lost their jobs in casinos. But many of the casino bosses are actually um, fighting to save their businesses. Now, some people would say oh, it's a good thing if they lose them, but there are actually, there are actually a lot of jobs there. And they're pretty much unionised jobs around the world, so in the, in the developed world at least. But what's happening there is while, you know, bonds are at zero interest and the investors can borrow at pretty much zero interest, they're actually charging, you know, exorbitant interest to those companies that are desperate for uh, um, uh, liquidity. And so, of course, they're going to make a killing out of this. And so again, borrow at zero interest, understandable in the current monetary environment, but my God, again, it's just that speculative uh, upswing that we saw was so dangerous and has never really gone away. So there are employers who are working very constructively with us. There are others that are just right bastards. I mean, our first worst company of the week was actually your own Qantas or our own Qantas who took money and then laid off workers. Now, you know, without explaining even to people what the situation was for them. Now, there's no doubt aviation around the world's in trouble, but you can't have it both ways. And many of the packages, and in fact, we asked our, we do a survey every two weeks, and we asked our 
uh, affiliates last week and 56% of them said that, uh, you know, workers who, uh, companies who've taken government support um, are actually not passing that on to workers. So the, the conditionality is just as lax on many companies as it was during the 2008-9 um, rescue packages. So there are some real bastards out there, I can tell you, but right now we're trying to get the kind of framework. The best policies are coming out of the EU on this question where there is a program called SURE, S-U-R-E, which has just approved the night before last after a lot of argument and lobbying from all of us on governments who didn't want to engage in the package with the EU governments, I mean, EU countries, um, particularly places like Netherlands and others who are Eurosceptic. But now it's actually in place. But it will give uh, zero or low, or, or low interest loans to companies provided that they are paying um, workers and that will be multinationals as well as small to medium enterprises directly. So while I have to pay it back, it's, uh, you know, if we, if we have a three to six months trajectory, it's possible. Some of those businesses, of course, won't come back and that's a whole other tragedy we'll have to face. Let me finish on recovery, reconstruction and resilience, as we call it. The UN Secretary General says we need to build back better. Well, that's true. But... The recovery will have to be different this time. Again, just to give you a scale of this, in, in 2829, we we're on a good globally coordinated pathway until the Toronto G20. And that's when the right-wing economists convinced uh, Europe that austerity was the way to go. Fiscal consolidation now or the debt would be just out of all proportion. And of course, they listened. So the rest is history. Ironically, only the US didn't, and remember it was the Obama days, didn't follow this path. But consequently, it, you know, the unemployment blip then was bad. It was really bad. But this time, we believe unless you get the kind of proposals in place for supporting maximum income with part-time work in some sectors, then the ILO's figures last week showed that we could uh, uh, lose the equivalent of about 196 million workers on an average full-time week. And, uh, and that's on top of the unemployment level, on top of the informal economy that already exists in our societies. So building back will require not just a recovery package that has to go, of course, to changing the way we think about public health. And we've written about this, I think, uh, you know, with my team, I've written almost a blog a day for the last few weeks because we have to get the narrative consolidated out there. And uh, that's been the night shift. But we, uh, we know that global, the way we think about global health has to change, just has to, or otherwise the risk of the next pandemic will set us on this pathway to the loss of human life, but also, uh, of course, uh, economic and social devastation. But we also have to bear in mind that we already have a convergence of crises. We have the, the inequality crisis, the climate crisis, we have the risks and opportunities of technology. Those things were already challenges to be dealt with in, uh, you know, in an integrated way. And now we've added the risk of pandemic and of course the recovery from COVID-19. So we've already said this is in fact now um, a, uh, a reconstruction that must be actually integrating the issues that were already wrong with the world and particularly in terms of uh, recovery from this crisis with all the employment and social implications with the climate crisis. If we don't take this chance, and that's why we talk about resilience, to build a sustainable economy as well as a uh, socially just economy, then um, I don't actually know when you'll get another chance or a starker reality. So already we're starting to see the neoliberal economists come out with their predictions and talk about the scourge of debt and so on. We have to be well advanced to deal with that. And, uh, you know, some of those middle of the road economists, I mean, he's French, so middle of the road, sort of very left of uh, many parts of the world, but some of those people 
Bart, like Blanchard, are all already talking about people having a different attitude to debt. Of course, it's important, but we, you know, you fiscally consolidate off growth and distribution, not off, um, you know, not from austerity. And the final bit I'll say is that we have to have a very different solidarity. You know, if we don't get a global protection fund that at least for the next five years is funded to build social protection in those developing economies, particularly the, the least developed countries, there are 28 of them, but also the, the uh, middle to uh, lower to middle income countries and countries desperately in need. You know, we have countries on our watch list, you know, even though India has the systems, you have to be frightened about India. You have to be more frightened about Pakistan, lower, you know, a, a poorer country, mini India, Indonesia, the Philippines, all those countries in our, in our part of the world, but then in the world I'm now responsible for, Latin America, Africa, you know, we are really, remember Africa and Latin America are still not at the curve. We've seen 1.6 or more now million infections recorded, recorded. The WHO says it could be, you know, any number of uh, increase on that and 100,000 deaths reached. But uh, it is really important that the solidarity component of recovery, reconstruction and resilience comes from a very different angle. And it'll only be our sorts of groups of people who will fight. So we are gonna have to fight for our own domestic future to change the rules. That's never been a more absolute slogan from the ACTU and from us globally. But we need also to change the rules for a much, uh, a much fairer and socially just, more socially just uh, future. So happy to answer questions. Leave you to that. Thank you, Sharon. Wonderful.